I'll go ahead and get started. All right. Aloha mai kako. My name is Brianna Govea. I'm the program specialist at the King Kamehameha V Judiciary History Center. Mahalo for joining us this evening for our last program of the year. <laughs> what a year it's been. I hope everyone who's joined us is safe and well. Um, while the remarks tonight don't necessarily represent opinions of the judiciary, I really want to thank Chief Justice Mark Rechtenwald and the Hawaii State Judiciary and Legislature for their continued support of our mission at the History Center and for providing a venue for this discussion. Excuse me. I'd also like to give a special thanks to my programming partner, uh, the Hawaii Council for the Humanities for creating the Why It Matters Civic and Electoral Participation Initiative, as well as the Hawaii State Bar Association Civic Education Committee for co-sponsoring this event. Um, and so just quickly before I introduce our panelists, I'd like to turn the spotlight over to um, the director of the Hawaii Council for the Humanities, Aiko Yamashiro, to tell us about the goal of the Why It Matters series. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much to the Judiciary History Center for organizing programs, really thoughtful programs all year long, helping us to talk about issues that matter and get more education around government processes, judiciary processes. Um, we at Hawaii Council for the Humanities are really proud to co-sponsor this event. And this event is part of a, a larger national initiative that's funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and administered by our, so we're a, the Hawaii State Humanities Councils and there's councils in every state and territory. And a lot of them are participating in this huge conversation called Why It Matters. Let's, let's learn more about our civic processes. Let's learn more about government. Let's reconnect to our communities and to what power means, what leadership means and, and come out of it feeling like we wanna get more involved. We know how to get more involved. Um, and we, we have our own reasons why, why this matters. So this is part of a series of programming that's gonna go on until April. Um, Judiciary History Center and, and us, Hawaii Council for the Human Humanities are gonna be working on a good chunk of it. So please you know, stay on our mailing list and come be a part of conversations in the new year as well. And if you wanna learn more about that, uh, our website, you can check out it's highhumanities.org. Again, thank you to our panelists tonight and I think we're going to introduce them now um, for bringing their whole hearts and their brilliance to such an important topic. And Mahalo Brianna for organizing us today. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Aiko. So it's my great pleasure now to introduce our panelists. Uh, can we, uh, we have Carrie Ann Chirota, Julia Morgan, and Mark Patterson. Carrie Ann is a civil rights attorney for the federal government and was formerly the director for Maui's, excuse me, Maui Economic Opportunities being Empowered and Safe Together Reintegration Program. Julia teaches philosophy and religion at Kauai Community College with specializations in ethics and legal, social, and political philosophy. Mark is the administrator of the Hawaii Youth Correctional Facility and in 2019 was appointed by the Office of Hawaiian Affairs to the Hawaii Correctional System Oversight Commission, which he currently chairs. So thank you all so much for being here tonight. Really appreciate you taking uh, your time. I know it's a little later than usual as well, so thank you. I just wanna encourage quickly our Zoom audience to send in any questions to our panelists using the Q&A function on the bottom of your webinar screen and we'll get to them in the last 15 minutes or so of the program. Also, we are recording the webinar and it'll be posted on the Judiciary History Center's YouTube channel. So I think um, first off, if we can start with you all just sharing a little bit more about uh, your background with the justice system, Hawaii's justice system, um, and what, what your thoughts are on, on how we're approaching criminal justice reform or the history of, of the judicial system and what our challenges are or what we're doing well in. So whoever might like to start with that. <laughs> I'll let the ladies go first. I'll, I'll start then <laughs> to, to begin. I think that, um, you know, personal experience, I think I'll share with the audience because it really shapes my view of our criminal legal system. I was born and raised on Maui. 
a very small rural upcountry area. And when I was six years old, my mom's younger brother, my uncle was murdered. And to this day, no one was ever arrested. No one was ever convicted of the charge. And knowing that throughout my life, um, I knew that even if someone had been arrested, convicted and served life, that that wouldn't have brought healing or peace to my family. And there had been conversations, I was six years old, I remember my grandmother speaking and someone made a comment, well, whoever, if they catch this person, you know, they should get the death penalty. Mind you, we don't have the death penalty now, but at one time we did. And my grandmother said very clearly, she says, that won't bring her son back. And whoever did this is somebody's child. And I think that when we live in an island community, we recognize that even when people commit harm, they're still related to us as family or neighbors or classmates, we're all connected in some way. And so that really shapes my view of our criminal legal system. And so I would say, you know, that kind of, that's a really big question. What are we, what are the challenges? What are we doing well? I would say there's really a laundry list of, of our challenges. Um, I think that there's been a criminalization of homeless, houseless, poor, disproportionately Native Hawaiians, African-American, Pacific Islanders. So we know that there are racial impacts. We also know that the LBGTQ community is disproportionately impacted. Uh, we have an unfair bail system. There's been mass overcrowding and we currently export our people and banish them to private prisons on the American continent, most of whom are Kanaka Maoli and are displaced from their ancestral homeland. Um, there are high recidivism rates there's limited resources for people while they're incarcerated in terms of education, programming, whether they need substance abuse, mental health treatment. And then co currently there's the COVID crisis, which where people are becoming ill, there have been outbreaks and even deaths. So those challenges are very stark, but I think we're, we see pockets of light we have to cling on to and we need to expand it and extract justice where we can. And I think that we have a, ATR 85 task force that really issued a report, how can we lead our system away from a punitive system to one of transformative justice and rehabilitation? We've had success in our juvenile justice system where we've decreased the number of youth in that facility, which Mark can speak to more so of. Um, there have been pockets of reentry programs, the MEO BEST program that I previously worked for that provided comprehensive reentry services with, in partnership with Department of Public Safety, with probation, parole, community nonprofits, and providing cultural programming on top of all of the other services that are needed. So I think if anything, we need to shine the light on what has been working, what works, what we can learn from other jurisdictions and apply it in here and, and tailor it to our community. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Carrie Ann. Mark, do you wanna add? Hey, uh, hello everyone. Thank you for allowing me to be here on the, this program tonight. Um, real quick, I've been about 34 years in the, in the profession. Uh, I see myself uh, as an adult correctional officer. Uh, so the first 20 years of my career, I worked in multiple prisons in the state of Hawaii and in the state of Nevada, uh, the, uh, working with men, yeah. Um, I eventually ended up at the Women's Community Correctional Center as the chief of security and, and became the warden. Uh, and I was there for about seven years. And then for the past seven years, I have been uh, with the youth correctional facility uh, in Hawaii. And we're doing uh, some great things there. Um, that's kind of my background and where I'm at right now. Um, I work so much with the men. I've worked so much with the women. And I remember in my conversations in all those years of what they shared with me about what happened to them when they were children. Yeah. And at the tail end of my career, I decided to, Hey, let me see what I can do with the youth, you know, with my experience of what I've learned in the adult system. So I can look at how do we, it, 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 trying to solve the adult problem can be such a huge task. Yeah. But maybe we can stop the next generation from going into the systems. Yeah. And, and, and that's where my, my passion is right now, is, is trying to um, take juvenile justice reform and what the, the courts have done and try to create a, 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 an alternative to incarceration, yeah? For those who are still uh, coming in. Society has social ills 
that will determine a pathway through our, through our state systems, yeah? And sometimes those ills cannot be solved overnight. So we know that levels of at-risk and vulnerability uh, will go through the system uh, based on the families and, and the communities from which they come through and their, and their life experiences. So how do we adjust our systems knowing that these people are coming through so that we can give them positive reinforcement to have them be more successful in life? And that's really uh, where I'm at that it's at this particular time in doing the multiple things that we are doing with incarcerated youth, victims of sex trafficking, homeless young adults between the ages of 18 to 25 and, and our vocational programs that we are running is really trying to get them a head start when no other opportunities existed for them. Yeah, um, that's kind of a short thing right there. Um, I'm very passionate about and I'm, I can share more as we move on toward the panel. Thank you, Mark. Julia, did you want to add anything about um, how your background in law and philosophy, how that shaped your perspective on this criminal, overly incarcerated system, this prison monster, this prison complex that our nation is, is so stuck in? Sure. First of all, thanks for inviting me. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I think for someone in my line of work, um, I'm going to step back just a little bit because for a philosopher, justice can mean anything from the specific criminal justice system to how we distribute goods and services. And those goods and services can be also privileges, rights, and duties. So uh, I was a practicing attorney for, I don't even remember, but I practiced on Oahu and I lived there for about 20 years and then completed my PhD and moved over and started really exploring um, legal, social, and political philosophy, primarily in the area of natural resource management and kind of that nexus between law and justice. Um, but also uh, I've looked at issues with regard to healthcare, with regard to education, as well as the general ethics of criminal justice and how we kind of, you know, sh how society has decided to shape our criminal justice system from the police all the way up to the judiciary. Uh, as far as things that we're doing well, I think, um, as Carrie Ann mentioned, the thing that I see that makes us different is community. Like there is a real sense of community. And I know that that might look different on Oahu than it does on Kauai, which is where I currently live. But by and large, I think we, we reject this kind of individual, invulnerable, you know, self-interested profit maximizer type of person. And I think that it's gonna be within our communities that we're gonna be able to solve many of these issues or at least take a step towards doing that. I think maybe where we're not doing so well um, and maybe what one of the biggest challenges is, but where we're also best maybe positioned to address this is that we're sort of trapped in this um, Western law, we're, we're trapped in a US law, right? And, and that doesn't always fit with the way the different cultures and the way the people here see the world. And so there can be this real tension and this real lack of like, well, why can't we talk about all of Mauna Kea? Why do we just have to talk about that lease? And that's the limitation of our Western law. And so really trying to figure out how we can shift precedent, how we can expand, how we can become more embracing of those different ways to see that will benefit us all. Thank you, thank you. Um, and we, we did touch a little bit on that more restorative approach. So I wanted to ask this next question about um, House Bill 1552 that was passed last year, now titled Act 179. And so the purpose of that, um, you know, establishing the Correctional System Oversight Commission um, and transitioning Hawaii to that more therapeutic rehabilitative system um, Mark, I know you have uh, direct experience in that. And so I was wondering how, how easy or how difficult is it for that transition to be made when you are, when you're, when your society is so entrenched in that punitive approach? Um, and have, have we made progress in that? How is the commission's work going? The journey from punitive to restorative is, is, is truly that. It's, it's gonna be a journey, yeah? And if, if, when I was reading the question and listening to you just now, um, uh, transformative leadership, right off the top of the head, my, my head, 
Yeah. You, you have to have progressive leaders, you know, mm -hmm. at all levels, not just from the warden to the, to the deputy of corrections, to the, the director of public safety and, and the governor himself and, and, the, and the heads of the big committees in the House and the Senate. It's about progressive leadership. <clears throat> you have to be supportive of it, you know. When we tried to make changes with the Women's Community Correctional Center, there was a lot of resistance, mm -hmm. a lot of resistance, yeah? So you really just had to start small and no matter that, no matter resistance that came from the department level, you know, it was the, it was the commitment of the staff that bought into the, to the, the vision of, of trauma-informed care initiative and understanding um, uh, why, the, why the women were there is, is really where we began that journey that eventually brought the women back uh, from the mainland and then decreased the population that was in the uh, facility, yeah? Um, leadership is important the, and the vision. You have to have the vision. Yeah, mm -hmm. how many of the people incarcerated in Hawaii really need to be there at this particular point in time? And why are they there? When I got to the Women's Community Correctional Center, 5% of the women had violent crimes. 95% of them was in there for drug or drug related crimes. So when you look at that, and this is a, this is a full blown medium security facility, which was really designed for those 5%, yeah? Not for the 95 who, who were actually minimum custody. What, Two thirds of the population was minimum custody. So when I, within a month after I got there, I told the warden, I said, you know, this is not a prison as we know it, like Halava is. This is more like a treatment center. Yeah, we we need to change the the focus on what we're doing here and more manage uh, manage programs so that the women can heal. Yeah, but we we know they're only going to do three to four years. So a lot of a lot of it is understanding the profile of the offender that you have. And what the what the programmatic needs are, and then creating the system, yeah, the system that's going to process the the transformation. So it's not just what I did um, at the facility, but what was happening with George uh, with Judge Arm in the in the front end with with uh, Hope Court. Yeah, I'm sorry, I may be doing that wrong, but you know, trying to keep women out of prison, coming to us, and me trying to keep them from coming back to us, which means you have to have people in the community that are working the system and working the restorative. So it's never about a single place, but it's about the entire system mm -hmm. that has to be working together in order to cause reductions, yeah? But at the same time, understanding that um, societal issues, people are still gonna be coming through. So how mm -hmm. best can we stop them from being incarcerated and how best can we stop them from coming back? Mm -hmm. We'll solve, that, solve our incarcerated problems. Was that a soapbox thing? <laughs> No, that was that was amazing. And I think I it's I clear feel. that I mean, it was amazing, fortunate, we're lucky to have you have had you in that position to carry out that transition and to recognize, hey, these women who are here, this institution is not serving their needs. It's it's wrong. And I think you are you epitomized what real justice, what justice was needed in that situation. And, and like you said, we need leaders to do that across the board, because this there's so many intersections and what Julia touched upon earlier with healthcare and education, it's so far reaching. Um, and there's too often silos within the system. Yeah. I was, I be, I'm, recently I've been sharing with people that 80% of what I do has nothing to do with my job. Yeah, 20% is my job. 80% is me working the front and the back. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That will influence everything I do in the middle. Yeah. So we have to, our administrators need to know how to go outside of their office, mm -hmm. outside of their silo to work with the groups that are going to be taking from them and who, who we taking from, yeah, mm -hmm. in order to create a continuity of care throughout the system. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Carrie Ann, did you want to add anything? I know you um, are, well as, are as well an advocate for the restorative justice system. Absolutely. Okay. So I think your question was how difficult or easy is it to transform from a punitive model to a transformative justice model? I think it's difficult if you are entrenched in the status quo and you're content with our current system where we spend millions of dollars and we have very high recidivism rates. So we're spending all this money and it's not making our community any safer. So if we believe in the current system, the status quo, then, well, we're, then it's gonna be difficult to change. 
But if we mm-hmm. have visionary leadership, people who are truly committed to reimagining public safety and what actually produces safety, then it's easy. And we have models. There are other jurisdictions, other jurisdictions. New Jersey has led the way, New York, even California with some court intervention, which we'll get to later today. Even Texas, which is notorious, you know, a lock them up, throw away the key for life kind of state. Many of these states have over the past maybe two, 20 decades, incremental in some cases, criminal justice reforms over a period of time where they have significantly reduced their population. Within, I would say, 13 years, New York, California, and New Jersey had decreased its population. I think one state, 9,000 persons, all the way up to California, in six years, reduced its population by 40,000 individuals. So when we talk about that reduction, we're talking about 40,000 people, but think about all of their loved ones, their children, the impact on the community. Right, so we have to think about this multiplier effect. In comparison, we have about 5,000 persons and maybe even lower right now, currently incarcerated in our system, state and as well as out of state transfers. So if we have committed visionary leadership, we can make a difference by reducing the population on the front end by changing sentencing laws, repealing mandatory minimum sentences, stop criminalizing all many behaviors which can be better addressed through mental health, to providing housing and education, all of the justice reinvestment, putting the money into that, even education, you know, early childhood education, along the way, eliminating the cash bail system, which is impacts poor people, has a disparate impact on native communities, um, minorities, diversion programs, fund diversion programs, so people have support in the community incarceration should be our last resort, our truly our last report. And maybe in the cases, and even some people would argue not, we, in terms of the abolition perspective, you don't even need prisons. There are other ways to handle even people who are considered violent. And I just wanna say that even persons who have been convicted of violent crimes have if given the opportunity, have tra- can transform their life. And in our program on Maui previously, We focus on working with individuals convicted of class A and class B felonies, considered the most serious and violent offenses. And there was a third party study done by Dr. Marilyn Brown from UH Hilo. And it showed that individuals in our program participants had a significant decrease in recidivism compared to another control group. So we know that all persons are capable of transformation and rebuilding their life. Um, So, and I also wanna point out in terms of like, whether it's easy or difficult, there are models, again, we can do things such as actually providing education, not only GED, but higher education, which is one of the greatest means to reduce recidivism is to offer people higher education. In California, they have the underground scholars. There's Bard Prison, Prison University Project in California. We can, we can fund that. And I always like to draw a comparison you know, for our community is that we spend approximately $60,000 to incarcerate one adult annually. Um, I think to incarcerate a juvenile back several years ago, it was almost $200,000 to incarcerate one youth. And we spend less than $20,000 to educate a child in our public school system. So you can see that there's a far imbalance in all of this. And if we start divesting from what we're investing in, which produces poor results, doesn't make us safer, put it into what we know it works, we will have a significant reduction in our incarcerated population we will have lower recidivism rates. And I also believe if we add a restorative justice practices as part of our system with the community leading the way, we'll also have greater healing, not only for those who have need to be held accountable for the harm that they committed, but the people who are harmed by those acts. Thank you, Kiriam. So I just wanted to jump in, I know originally, That wasn't the plan, but um, the idea of restorative justice isn't necessarily new, right? So the early Greeks believed in restorative justice. As a matter of fact, follow up on what Carrie Ann said, they argued that people did wrong because they didn't know any better. So if someone does wrong, you educate them and then they won't do wrong, right? So there's this sense that humans aren't evil by nature, that we're forced into actions because something something isn't right and we need to fix that something isn't right. It's my understanding in the 50s and 60s, we had a a fairly large restorative justice uh, 
program running. So this isn't something that's new all of a sudden and it shouldn't freak people out. But I think what happens is, is that so many people are wedded to this get tough on crime. And when you have this narrative of get tough on crime, you lose the sense that these are real individuals, as both Mark and Carrie and have said, right? Crime becomes an object. It becomes like your washing machine or like a newspaper. It's not a real individual who is part of a context and part of greater social uh, forces that, that are in a situation, right? And so we need to figure out how to shift that situation. So from my perspective, it's not just these pieces that, that Mark and Carrie Ann are talking about, it's also all of the other things that need to change. And I think this is one reason why, you know, um, reform is so difficult is because we don't have one answer that's gonna fit at all, all times, forever and ever, you know, never gonna change, but it's this like swirling mass that we have to grab a piece and try to unravel. And so I think that becomes difficult. And maybe just like they said, having leadership that says, nope, this is gonna be hard, but we're gonna take a crack at it because these are human beings and we're human mm -hmm. beings and this is mm -hmm. important. So. Thank you, Julia. I think that's a good, oh yeah, go carry on. Sorry, I just wanna add on because I think that we have this forum to talk about the Oversight Commission. I think part of it also to help us move to that system is that we need to fully fund the Oversight Commission. They currently do not have a budget, which does not allow them to hire staff um, which in some ways li really limits the scope of their work. And so if we're created this commission, like anything else, we've created it and it's basically on paper right now. And this is an opportunity for the community to champion the work of the Oversight Commission, which is a really long battle. I mean, some of us at the legislature were advocating for almost two, 20 years, advocating for an oversight model, an oversight body. So now we have it in place, but it's under unfunded and the governor and the legislature have a duty to fund this oversight commission. I just have a, a question to that. I couldn't okay. agree more um, yet with the pandemic budget constraints are on top of everyone's mind. And so how do we, how do we navigate that? Do you have any perspective on that? I do, but I don't know. Maybe I should let other folks, I, of course I have a, I have a well, I feel like the, if anything, the, the pandemic is highlighting what we always have known, that unhealthy jails and prisons equals unhealthy communities. We see that there are outbreaks that are impacting staff, incarcerated persons, and that impacts first responders, the community. I mean, so we just need to recognize that they are members of our community and um, we need to treat them accordingly. But in terms of resources, there's always going to be an issue of who gets the resources. And we have to decide, again, are we getting the best return for our money of putting $60,000 to incarcerate a person when you could spend a fraction of that on potentially like supplements for housing, education, reentry training? You're going to get far more of an impact that will increase community safety. The other thing is that while this pandemic is going on, for the last few years, the state continues to fund new jail and prison projects. Even this past year, the state legislature allocated, I think, a, maybe another two or three million to expand the Maui Regional Public Safety Complex. Keep in mind that this is on top of the almost 15 million that has already been spent for planning, planning and design, even though the community came out years ago and said, we do not want another jail. We believe that we can put funding into reentry and other types of restorative justice programs. And while that's occurring, there's also money that's been going into planning and design for OCCC. They're also planning to expand the women's prison. So the, the women's population has been decreasing. And as you know, the state and PSD was going to cut the funding for YWCA, the only women's furlough program in Hawaii, which is very successful. They were cutting that. But at the same time, they were allocating, I think it was over another million for operational costs at the women's prison and they want to expand it even though the, re the population is going down and so we have to ask ourselves who is benefiting from this is it the consultants the corporations like core civic they run the private prison in saguaro their show shareholders are very happy because hawaii is one of their best customers i mean year after year people have been sick people have been murdered and we continuously renew these contracts. And so I think, you know, we're gonna get to it a little more. It's like, there is this disconnect. On one hand, we espouse like being a, a community of value and aloha and, 
restorative justice. And at the same time, we continue to fuel these policies of mass incarceration. And I really believe though we're at a tipping point. And so this crisis is also providing us with an opportunity to rethink everything, to reimagine public safety and really put our resources into what works to build a healthier, safer community. I just wanted to add a little bit to what Carrie Ann is saying in terms of the commission. Um, and this is something I learned. Uh, um, this is my first time that I sat on the commission, but the commission is, is um, dictated by what is known as the sunshine law. Yeah. So the sunshine law, you know, one of its uh, standards is that the commission cannot meet as a group on its own. Yeah. The commission uh, can only meet together uh, in a public forum. Okay. So Basically, we can't even call each other and talk to each other and plan and do things. Uh, we can only do it in a public forum. So that kind of in inhibits us. The staff or the oversight coordinator was, was, is the person that unites all of us. Yeah? We have all these people sitting on the commission who are experts uh, in the judicial system as well as in public safety. I have a lot of years behind them. And the oversight coordinator is the individual that's going to bring all that expertise and in the, uh, information uh, to a point and then do the, do the hands and the eyes and the ears of the commission on a daily basis. Yeah. Um, we found out in the early uh, months of the pandemic, the governor suspended the sunshine law. So the commission was actually able to meet and talk about the pandemic. And we, we exercised our, that uh, ability and, and sent letters and was part of the uh, advocating for the release of the, so to lower the the inmate populations at Ochukusi, all, all the uh, jails. And so we were very effective at that time when we were able to meet two, three times a week in terms of uh, Zooming. But once the Sunshine Law was reactivated, that, that hampered us. And so that's where we're kind of talking about our funding. It's just really for our staff in order to do what the, what the uh, uh, Act 179 uh, was intended for us to do, what all the work 20 years before us carry on, you know, mentioned it that brought us to this point for the creation of the commission and we've just been uh not able to to walk and run yet because we're hampered without our staff and without our funding and so that's kind of where we are right now very frustrating mm -hmm. thank you mark i think um i want to touch quickly on the topic we talked about a little earlier about visionary leadership and so with the local election that just passed, former judge Steve Alm, uh, now Honolulu's prosecutor, he acknowledged to the American Civil Liberty Union of Hawaii that systemic racism and implicit bias do affect our system. And so I wanted to pose this question, um, which I'll follow up more with the, some stats in a minute. Um, just this question of how, how does that simple acknowledgement change have the potential to change our institution, our approach and the community's recognition of these issues? And is recognition enough? Is it what, you know, action, action is what matters, right? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm sure others wanna, I'm sorry, I'm like very excited about this topic here. But I think like anything else, I mean, for me, Yes, Judge Am um, is a public figure. He's currently in, gonna be in a very important role that holds a lot of power. Essentially, he is a gatekeeper in the prosecutorial role. They have so much influence upon whether the incarcerated population expands or contracts. And I hope that he sees that as a sacred duty and that we do not need to keep incarcerating as many people as we do. But that aside, you know, this acknowledgement for me, it, maybe it's not so startling because if you look back, um, over the last decades, literally, there's a Dr. Kassenbaum who did a study about the disparate impact of Native Hawaiians in the criminal legal system in Hawaii decades ago that showed these disparities. And every maybe 10 years or so, we have another study repeating what we already know, that Native Hawaiians are disproportionately impacted, targeted every stage of the criminal legal system from arrest to incarceration, to longer sentences, to having parole revocation. And so, yes, an acknowledgement is important, I think, from public figures. There was even a, a criminal justice, a Native Hawaiian task force 
to address these issues in OHA's report in 2011. I think though we're at the point again is that I as an criminal justice advocate, I believe that it's very frustrating to hear people to just acknowledge this year after year, decade after decade, while the problem continues. And so I think that like anything else with these reports, oftentimes there are recommendations about how to address these disparities, but we rarely ever implement any of them. And so that comes back to visionary leadership and a commitment. If we truly profess that we believe that there, our justice system should be equal and it's blind, then we will put resources and do what we need to do to work together from criminal justice agencies to nonprofits in the community to, to decrease these stark disparities, particularly with the native population of Hawaii. Uh, I, I honestly believe that Judge Ahmed can be <coughs> in his leadership role, uh, should he choose to, to put a lot of action behind what he just said. Um, now mind you, what I'm gonna talk about next is, is, is youth and, and juveniles. Uh, Judge Browning was the head of family court when they decided that putting kids in prison does not work, 2010. And he literally led his judges to be creative on alternatives to incarceration, yeah? And in 10 years, from 2010 to 2020, you know, the incarcerated population has been reduced by uh, 75%, you know, because they, they stuck to their guns and, and they helped create the alternatives um, that they don't have to send the children to incarceration. Now that's working in the community as well. And as a, as a, as a court, as family court in all the islands is finding those areas or those nonprofits in the community that can help them rather than send the child to the incarcerated uh, process. So when you look at Judge Arm, he, has, he, he can be the model right now of looking at his prosecuting staff and pre-trial and really trying to figure out, it's not, it should be, it's not about putting them all away, so which ones don't have to go. You know, really take a different perspective at the individual that you're gonna be prosecuting and say to yourself, do, you know, do we really need to put him in? Do we trust him enough to show up on his own? You know, um, if we have, you know, four to 500 people in OCCC with a hundred dollar bail, that's kind of, you know, defeats the purpose because we're saying at one point that they're not a threat to public safety, but they gotta give us hundred, uh, hundred dollars, but they don't have a hundred dollars. And now we're holding them and it's costing us more to hold them than the bill that we gave them, you know? And that's a large number if you think about it, you know? So how do we encourage the judges to use their authority? Yeah, and their, and their decision-making and discretion to um, be the best gatekeepers they can be, yeah? Carrie Ann mentioned the word gatekeeper and I'm so such a believer that in, in the entire system, there are key points that people control, yeah? And then when we later go on with other, some of these other questions in, in regards to disparity, um, these in, uh, disparate uh, ethnic groups are the ones that go through the system are the ones that the gatekeepers are keeping in and not affording them the right to, to leave yeah, or get out at an earlier point. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, very significant if he can pull something together. And I know he's done a lot when he was a judge and I, I'm hoping to see a lot more visionary um, leadership in the prosecutor's office. Thank you, Mark. Julia, do you want to add anything about that, that role, that relationship between power and justice? Yeah, so I think, um, and I applaud the recognition, um, but I think in many ways, recognizing institutional racism has kind of taken on the same sort of um, feeling as a public apology. You know, for a while, every political official was apologizing for something they'd done. And they're, they're be not that I don't think Judge Alm is um, sincere, I believe he is, but I, I agree that we need to really take some action. And he is in a position to do that, not only with, you know, whether he's going to promote restorative justice or diversion programs, or maybe do a, a JDAI type initiative, whatever it is that he's going to do, but I think he also needs to change the very tenor of, of the prosecutor's office. I mean, I don't know if it's still the case, but when I was practicing, the definite feeling was that you were a good prosecutor if you won. So you took cases that you could win because that was all that mattered. And I think we need to back away from this idea that a prosecutor is all about just putting people away. 
because you know that's that's like the police are only there just to catch criminals you know i i think we need to and this is what restorative justice does for us is it it takes it out of these sort of isolated um mark used the word silo but these these little pockets where people go after the bad guys and becomes more of a community thing. So what are we going to do as a community to make this better? So yes, I do think, I, I think he can change narratives. I think he can decide who to charge and who not to charge. Um, and I think maybe he can lead the way in really shifting again, how we talk about this. Thank you, Julia. So I want to just get this on the record for this program. Um, some of uh, these reports that we're, um, we've kind of alluded to throughout the program. And, and the data is alarming in, in the disparities. And as Carrie Ann said, it's the same almost year after year. And so I just wanna share this quickly and then um, I'll get to my question. So in 2018, this was put out by the Hawaii Department of Public Safety. And they stated that while native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders made up an estimated 23% of adults in the state in 2018, the Department of Public Safety reported that 40% of people incarcerated in that year were Native Hawaiians, and another 6% were identified as Samoan or Guam slash Pacific Islander. Additionally, um, recently last month, the American Civil Liberties Union of Hawaii wrote that over the pandemic, the Honolulu Police Department issued over 50,000 citations. They were 30 times more likely to arrest a Micronesian person and five times more likely to arrest a Black or Samoan person for violations of the COVID-19 order than to arrest a white person. Oh, it's a lot. It's So I want to get to this, this issue of in our, in our national values and our community values, we focus a lot on this premise of equality for all, justice for all. We're all created equal. Um, we should treat everyone fair and with equality. But when we look at this data and when you ask people about their experiences, it is undeniable that there is difference and, and injustice in the experiences that um, different ethnicities, uh, different class, gender disparities face with arrests and incarceration. So I wanna ask, what is, what is true justice? What, is, what does that even mean? And um, is equality the approach or is, yeah, what, where do we go from here? How do, how do we get out of this? What approach is enough? That's a philosophical question. Julie. <laughs> I, I was wondering if that's why you all were waiting. Usually you're like, no, this is me. And it's like, no, I'm not gonna. So it's, this is a really interesting question because this is actually something I ask my students. Like mm -hmm. we, we throw around words like equality and everyone says, well, we have to embrace equality, but do we, and what does that even mean? And we throw around words like justice. And to be honest, I don't know what justice means. I, I don't know if justice is like a universal thing and it means the same for every person. Um, if it does, then somehow we've lost that connection. I know there are philosophers who say that justice is like one of our, one of our appendages, right? And in order to be a truly human, human being, you need to be just, what, whatever mm -hmm. that might mean, right? Um, maybe justice is a social construct, in which case, in many ways, we have more power, but we're also more responsible, right, for, for what's happening in a way, because we define justice to be, it is okay that the same groups of people get hit every single time. It is okay to use your prison as a storehouse for poor people or for people who don't look like you or whatever that case may be. And if that is justice and we're just not owning up to it, then yeah, we need to have some hard conversations. Um, but I think, uh, so I don't know what justice is, but I think it's really important that we have a conversation about what it is and what it means and what our role is in creating it. And I know that that sounds really sort of um, philosophical and like something we do when we're drinking and hanging out, not that we're drink, but you know what I'm saying, that, you know, that we just sort of, but, but in many ways, I think the fact that we don't have these conversations prohibits us from really 
exploring some of the problems with what that word justice means. And so, because it does, it does shape our society. And I think the same is with equality. I, I would maybe take some issue agree with some, the way you maybe phrased that question. I don't think equality is it. I, I think in some cases, we, my vote should be equal to your vote and it should be equal to Mark's vote. But am I equal to you? Am I equal to Mark? Are there places where I shouldn't go in Hawaii because of who I am? You know, and then it becomes equity. Right? We don't all start with a level playing field, should we? If, if it were equality, we never would. So I think um, one of the things that we really need to do when we have these conversations is be prepared for us to disagree with each other and embrace that disagreement, but also be prepared for us not to have an answer. I think it's okay that we don't have an answer. We know what it is not. It's called arguing in the negative, right? I know justice is not the fact that the dump goes in Y and I every single time. Like I know that is unjust, but what what is the what is the just side that Hawaii Kai should get it for once? That you know, Fort <laughs> should have it. I mean, is that justice or maybe the justice is that we stop making trash? You know what I'm saying? So I, I guess it, and, and this is where we can go deeper than. Um, one of the things I, I should have said, and I didn't with the earlier discussion um, about Judge Alm, is that we fundamentally need to change the way we see crime, the way we see criminals, the way we see each other in community, but also how justice and equality fits into that. And that means asking like deep questions. Like, what do we want to look at as a society? Are we just storing people? What does that mean? They're no longer people. If that's the case, then bring back slavery. I'm not serious, but but you know we need to take um, the consequences of our actions seriously and of our thoughts seriously. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah, you, Juliet. Mm -hmm. I could maybe chime in on that. I think that sometimes it's like we can talk about what it is or what it isn't and of course subject to varying views. You know, as a six-year-old child, when I was young, um, I would point out to my parents discrepancies why my brother was maybe treated more favorably compared to my sisters and I. That was unfair, you know, from that sort of vantage point. I think, I, you know, I like to Think about what other people who are philosophers say about it, but Dr. Cornell West says that never forget that justice is what love looks like in public. Um, and Archbishop Desmond Tutu says, true peace must be anchored in justice and unwavering commitment to universal rights for all humans, regardless of ethnicity, religion, gender, national origin, or any other identity attribute, you know, really going towards universal rights. And I think for me, even though I've worked within this field of quote, civil rights, I've never cared for the term, I believe more in universal human rights, and also to include the aina, um, because we cannot sustain ourselves without malama aina and aloha aina, that's just a foundational to I think many of us and our belief system. But I think going back to the issue of equity, it's really interesting because I agree too that equality is not the benchmark, it's equity. And the example, a lot of my background has been in fair housing, fair employment laws. And so if a person has a disability, let's say in a housing context, that person may be entitled for a reasonable accommodation, maybe an assistance animal, maybe some other kind of modification to their unit in order to afford them the equal use and enjoyment of their property compared to another person without a disability. So we have many examples within the legal context of which we recognize that not all people have the same equal access or the same type of resources available to them. And I think housing is really important to the also in over incarceration because there is a lot of studies that show that where someone lives impacts their life trajectory, their, their zip code can impact whether they have a better education. Somebody may be in an affluent community compared to another community where there's less resources, failing schools. Um, that can impact all sorts of life opportunities. And so I think, again, when we look at equity, we need to go back to, again, in the case of persons who incarcerated, even when they are, quote, done and maxed out on their sentence, we have all these collateral consequences, all of these barriers that we put into place that really serve as an infringement to people reintegrating and giving back and contributing to their families and our communities. And so these are all the areas that we can start addressing and changing laws to give people really truly opportunities to transform their lives and contribute to, our, to their families and our community. 
I just wanted to share real quick, Brianna, you know, when I, when I think about that question, what is justice for me and, and the work that we've done uh, in the community, it's it really, how do, you, how do you bring balance back to relationships? Yeah. And as a Native Hawaiian, you know, our ancestors, that was such an important thing in maintaining relationships within the family, within the village and, and the greater community. And, you know, um, that's where Ho'oponopono came in. It was very strong because there were mediators within the families and mediators within the village that maintained the relationships because you, you valued the individual, the individual's gift to the family and the individual's gift to the village, right? And that was basically for survival, for defense, to feed. You know, he had a value. Um, we no longer have that concept of valuing the individual in our, in our family or in, in our society because we've lost the ability to maintain relationships, yeah? So we have relationships with your family, you have relationships in the community, and many who have come to uh, being incarcerated, and some of you may not agree with this, is the ability to have a relationship with themselves, yeah? To have the confidence and, and the motivation to, that they're, they're worth something, yeah? And a lot of, um, when we were working at the women's prison, a lot of them came to that aha moment and, and, and life changed for them because they felt that, you know, issues of, of, that they were having could be resolved by being with somebody else, which was, a, which was just detrimental to their overall existence in terms of relationships. Um, but I feel, you know, if we can solve and, and uh, at the point of crime, when, when, when victim and, and perpetrator can come together and have those, those discussions, that's what restorative justice is about. It's about restoring relationships. Yeah, everything. Um, a lot of my kids right now, a lot of them just lack empathy for their victims, you know, and that's just something they learn of the circumstances that they've been in in their lives. So how do you teach empathy? Yeah. Uh, how do you teach them to have that relationship that, you know, you shouldn't harm somebody else and you shouldn't steal, or you shouldn't take from somebody else. Yeah. So that's where um, my, my manao is really at this point. Uh, how do we put value back into our, into our neighbors, into our community and individuals? Yeah. It's not an easy, easy thing to do, but how do we start that process? Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> Mahalo everyone. I mean, I'm, I feel so honored to be a part of this discussion and I'm so thankful for all the answers you guys have, have thrown uh, at us in the audience. Um, I know there were some pretty heavy, heavy questions and we only have a few more minutes left now. So I wanna turn to our audience um, Q&A. Uh, we have some questions in the chat about taking advantage of the time, building upon the momentum of population reduction due to COVID. Uh, what, what are the most important next legislative steps beyond funding the Oversight Commission? Would any of you want to take, take a stab at those? <clears throat> sure, okay. I think um, in terms of building momentum, the Supreme Court passed an order earlier this year in light of COVID that significantly, well, maybe not significantly, decreased the population. A larger number, I think it was close to 800, more than any other time really in recent history. They have the authority and the ability to do that. I understand that there's currently a writ before the Supreme Court pending that could potentially release more individuals. The order that came from the Supreme Court earlier this year was at a period of time, I think what either was pre the outbreak of OCCC. Now we have outbreaks at almost every single facility and we actually have people who have been severely ill and people who are dying. Some people who may have died and gone in for maybe a lower level crime or drug and they are, they're basically getting a death sentence. That is a violation of our Eighth Amendment, Cruel and Unusual Punishment. And I hope and I pray that our Supreme Court will uphold the constitutional rights of individuals, the right and the duty of the state to provide for the health and welfare. If we're locking people up, we have a legal responsibility to provide certain basic treatment, health care for them. And we know that with overcrowding, that the different facilities, they are unable to practice all of the CDC protocols to mitigate COVID in our jails and prisons. There are some other states that have taken efforts to further reduce their population. And I, again, I hope and I pray that our Supreme Court steps up because sometimes in cases of this, 
for some segments of our community, they don't care about incarcerated people. There is this belief like, hey, you did the, you did the crime, you do the time. But then there's also other members of our community that recognize that 95 to 98% of all people who are incarcerated will eventually come home. They will be our neighbors. Their children will go to school with us. So if we really want to build this safe and healthy community, we need to start investing in people and providing the support services for them to be successful in the community. In terms of legislation, I would love to see our legislators. They also can pass legislation to reduce our population. They can fund diversion programs. They can eliminate cash bail. They also have the ability to repeal mandatory minimum sentences, which we tend to follow the sort of federal crime bill. I think it's you know years ago that increased our incarcerated population exponentially. So there are a number of bills at the legislature. And I just wanna highlight, um, I believe there also may be a bill on a moratorium to stop all spending on jails and prisons, planning, construction to just come to a full stop and let's reevaluate because there are alternatives to building more jails and prisons that can build a safer community. So it takes leadership as Mark alluded to, at every single level. What's happened in Hawaii, unfortunately, is that the state legislature sometimes will point to the governor. The governor will point to PSD, Department of Public Safety. Public Safety will throw their hands up and say, well, we don't have a say in who comes into our jails and prisons. We have to accept everyone. But that's not factually true. There are a lot of ways that the Department of Public Safety, by their policies and programs and where they put resources in, can decrease the population. So if every part of the system, all branches of government do their part, then we will see a decrease in the population and our community will benefit for it. But it's time to stop pointing fingers and for everybody to take responsibility for the greater good and for, for transformative justice. Real quick, and I, Brianna, I know we're losing some time, but um, in the Senate, and in the house, you have the public safety committees, you know, uh, so you really want to be able to talk and, and, and for momentum on, on the commission is to send letters or, or, or speak to Senator Nishihara or Representative Ohm, who's, who's the new head of the uh, House's uh, public safety committee. You have uh, Senator Dela Cruz, the head of Ways and Means, and you have uh, Representative Luke, who's the, the head of finance, yeah. The whole point is they're going to use COVID-19 as a means of not funding the commission. Yet, uh, I think the, the few hundred thousand dollars that we may be asking for uh, will save them lot more money in the long run. Yeah, you really have to hold the department accountable. And the, the legislature needs to have a body like the, like the commission in order to tell them, no, that's not true what they're saying. We need to hold them accountable because they do have as aspects of their own policies that they can utilize to reduce the population. They just failed to do it, yeah? And that, that goes for uh, pre-trial as well, yeah? So that's how you folks can be of help to us at this particular point as we prepare to go into the 2021 legislative session. Thank, thank you. There's um, one more question related to the, the medical treatment or mistreatment of inmates. So it reads, there needs to be more health and programs in prison so that medical problems such as COVID-19 do not spread. What is being done about this or what can be done about this? How do we make, how do we improve healthcare in the criminal system? That, that's a hard question to ask. <laughs> as, you know, none of us are working within public safety at this particular point in time. Mm -hmm. And, and having and not knowing what issues are, are are there currently, yeah, I will say this much in terms of uh, the overall um, correctional staffing is normally the biggest issue that the facilities have, and I do know that they have serious shortfalls in their correctional officers. Uh, which without correction officers, you can't run programs. Without correction officers, you can't transport medical or, or provide mental health uh, uh, programming. So that's not an excuse, but it is, a, it is a, a fact that without staffing, you can't do those things. So um, I'm not trying to defend public safety or not, but to answer that question is really difficult. Um, but knowing that they do have staffing shortfalls within our correctional system, how, how do we make it happen? You know. 
And that's where the visionary and the creativity comes in. You know, I'm not saying that that's, that's an excuse, but we, when you get to a point where you don't have staff and you're shutting down visits and you're shutting down everything, you're going to have to think outside the box. Yeah. Because basically you're going to, you're going to start the beginning of a powder keg and it's just going ready to blow. It's going to blow. Mm -hmm. That's how I would talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> I have some thoughts about that. I want to chime in. Um, you know, granted, I have not worked within the Department of Public Safety, but I have worked as a partner agency through MEO Best Reintegration Program some years ago. So I do understand some of the challenges that occur inside. But I think what can be done currently to address the health, first and foremost, we've been saying it all tonight, and we're going to keep saying it, by reducing the incarcerated population. That is the most significant thing that our community our agencies and state can do to reduce further outbreak threats and prevent further deaths from COVID. Because when you reduce the population, there's less overcrowding, then you can actually practice social distancing. We need to ensure that there's um, PPE protective equipment, sanitizing for all, not only the staff, but also for persons who are incarcerated. We need to waive all medical co-payments. Currently people have co-payments that they have to pay if they visit the doctor we should be waiving that. That's considered a best practice. And as of a few months ago, we were one of, I think, two states in the United States that have not waived medical co-payments in light of COVID-19. So we are intentionally not adopting a best practice. Um, the other thing that we need to do is because there is, there have been shortages, staff have been sick, there have been shutting down of programs, visitation. These are all really, really important for people to feel a sense of hope, progress, um, to work towards either release or parole. And when you stop all of these programs, what's been happening is that the department has not been engaging in visionary leadership and thinking about how can we offer some of these services in alternative modalities. There can be tablets, you can do visits through through tablets, other electronic means, provide even free paper, envelopes, stamp so that people can write to their loved ones. They could even waive phone call fees because of the fact they can't see their loved ones in place. I mean, just imagine some of us may have had loved ones in the community with someone with COVID and we're worried we can't see them at the hospital. Can you imagine what it's like when their loved one is inside and there's no communication, you don't know what's going on, but you might see on the news that outbreak over 50% of the people are with COVID and this many people are dying. I mean, just in terms of being compassionate and having humanity. Um, but again, I think the programming is really important because there are a number of people who have been granted parole with chair to set on their release dates. And some of them are still inside and they're gonna have their parole dates further pushed back instead of being released, even though alternatives exist. The parole board could release a person with a, additional conditions that they continue substance abuse treatment in the community or continue other types of programming in the community. And there are some other jurisdictions that are adopting these policies in light of COVID. And we know that COVID is not going away anytime soon. And so if we are truly caring about people and want people to progress through the system and get into the community with supports in place, um, there, there's a number of best practices that we can look to and we can adopt and implement. Thank you, Mark and Carrie Ann. I know we're a little over time. Um, I would like to ask Julia maybe to uh, close us off with some final thoughts to wrap up the discussion, if if you're okay with that. Um, sure, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess, I think the interesting thing about this panel for me is that even though Mark and Carrie Ann are like really in the trenches, right? That that, and I am not, that we still are using similar language, right? We're still talking about similar things. We're still talking about what it means to be a human being. We're still talking about um, like really, really thinking deeply about what it means to incarcerate somebody and why should we be incarcerating somebody and what that looks like. Right now, it looks like we excise them from the community as if it were some sort of cancer and we let them sit there and then we blame them for why they went there. But but why are we doing that? And, and what is, so in, in many ways I found this interesting because there's some overlap, but I can also see where all of this is really necessary and kind of getting back to 
my personal bias, which is education, right? I mean, we've been talking about demanding sort of visionary leadership, but they're not gonna have the political will to be visionary unless we as a community give that to them. And we as a community aren't gonna give that to them unless we have the education to know what that looks like. Unless we have the power that comes with education. You talked about justice and power. Well, education is what gives us that power to, to demand justice. It would gives us that power to stand up and say no, or yes, or I want better than this because my society should be better than this. So I don't know if I wrapped that up, but I just- No, thank you, Julia, yeah. Everybody. Um, it was really a very enlightening panel. So thank you, Mark and Carrie Ann. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Carrie Ann. Thank you, Julia. Thank you to everyone who sent in um, your questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to get to them all. Um, but again, this is gonna be recorded. So I really hope you share this far and wide with your friends and family. Uh, I learned a lot. Again, it was an honor to speak to you all tonight and I'm so appreciative of your time um, as we get later into the evening. And I just want to say thank you and I hope everyone takes care and stays safe as we try to make it through the rest of this year. And um, yes, just mahalo and, and have a great night, everyone. Aloha, mahalo. <laughs>